Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Can I offer you a warm welcome to Arabs? And I'd like, first of all, to thank uh, Tom Armour and the uh, landscape team at Arabs for kindly agreeing to host this morning's debate. Uh, my name is Paul Link and I'm Deputy Chief Executive of the Landscape Institute and I'm very delighted to welcome you uh, to this very important event this morning. Uh, the Landscape Institute is a professional body uh, representing landscape architects, landscape designers, managers and planners and as such we do not ourselves hold a particular position on whether or not it is right to remain in the EU. We do, however, as an educational charity, believe that we have a mission to make sure that our members have as many facts and think as clearly as possible about the implications of any vote later in this month. And therefore, I'm really delighted that we're focusing this morning on a topic which, as far as I can see, has not received a great deal of airing, and that is the impact on the environment on any decision which is made. Um, I'm therefore very pleased to um, invite John Vidal, who is, uh, who is Environment Editor at The Guardian, uh, who will chair this debate and who will also introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, kind of seconds out round one, I think, now. <laughs> I, I'm going to start by, by just saying, how many people here have not made their mind up yet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, well, at least we don't, I, I, I won't be able to, maybe at the end we can say if anyone has changed their mind, but, uh, but uh, okay, so this is a debate which we needed to have some time ago, we haven't had, it's actually it's a very good debate to have, not just because we've got this, this in, enormous decision to make in the next two or three weeks, because we really do need to get to the bottom of why the environment in Britain is not working and how it could work better and so on and so forth and, and so you know thanks for coming along um, this is in, this, this I hope will feed into the, the, the much bigger debate a much more important debate in a funny way about where the environment in Britain goes and it's my own opinion and I know that people in charity are not allowed to express what they think or say or do or anything but it's my own opinion that this is absolutely a dividing line in which way we go forward. Do we stay with what we know, the devil we know, or do we go to the devil we don't know? Um, and this is a little bit what we hope to tease out today uh, from our speakers. And uh, uh, few of them need any introduction. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, okay, so the first is Merrick Denton Thomas. Um, Thompson, is it Tom Thompson? Thompson with a P. I came across this cove in uh, New, not Newbury, what do you call it? Twyford Down, very, very many years ago. And um, he was on the battle lines as uh, uh, Hampshire County Council's landscape chief, and uh, therefore is wholly responsible or not responsible for that great gash through, through Twyford Down. But he did, I know, I know that this man fought <coughs> valiantly in law as well as in person and very, you know. He did try to say that extremely, I say, and I've, I've, I haven't followed your work all the way since, but just for that alone, thank you very much indeed. Um, and so he's going to say a few words. Um, you going to say it now? I will. You've, well, okay, get it over with. If I may. If you, you may indeed, but you may not express your own opinion, and you know that. <laughs> you may be arrested by the, uh, by the green police or someone. <laughs> Well, a massive thank you, first of all, to John Yu. To well, I was going to say, will you all turn your phones off? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. God, it's like the House of Commons. It's now a bad kiss. So I'll start again. John, thank you very much for um, taking the chair here and imposing some discipline on us uh, rabble. And a big thank you to George and Kerry for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come and uh, contribute to this debate. So I'm quite excited um, about this discussion. Um, environment hasn't had a major role to play in the debate so far, although underlying some of the big issues, such as migration, of course, environment is very much a main uh, steerer of migration and something we mustn't forget because we tend to paper over cracks and uh, um, you know, plaster over cracks, but actually the fundamental issues are basically founded in environment. Um, I personally think that we have um, some really good things about Europe and the environment, and I think we have some poor things about Europe and the environment. So you can see I'm sitting on the fence here, um, and I am going to express my views, but I'm going to be even-handed, which I think still 
uh, sticks within the regulations uh, for, for charities. So um, on the plus side, of course, we have some very strong EU uh, environmental directives, which have been transposed into UK law. Um, going back a long time, actually the M3 is a good example of this, was the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive in 1985, with the emphasis, by the way, on non-technical summary, and that is a really good message from Europe, actually empowering people to participate in the decision-making process. Um, we think, I think as a profession, that it is vital we have a regulatory framework within which we get the best out of development and the best out of sustaining the management of scarce, irreplaceable resources. We think that a lot of the environmental issues are difficult to pin down in traditional cost-benefit analysis terms, and therefore there is a need to have a regulatory framework. How heavy that is depends, of course, upon the part that development and land management play. So, as placemakers, you know, we believe that regulation is right. Um, so my first question uh, uh, to the speakers, um, are the environmental uh, directives, European environmental directives, across all of their spectrum, and I'm not going to go through all those now, uh, that have been transposed into UK law, are they safe in your hands if you are going to be recommending going out of Europe? So that's a question for George. Um, so my second point is that actually there are some profoundly poor things about Europe and the environment, particularly in terms of this country where our countryside defines us as a nation. And I would say that the common agricultural policy is profoundly dysfunctional. Farming is actually on its knees. I mean, the most profitable uh, area of farming, the arable sector, now relies upon 51% of its profits from the public purse. Please don't let's call it a subsidy. What we must do is to move in a positive direction and support the farming industry in multifunctional landscapes. But remember in the <coughs> 70s and 80s, the capital grants from Europe for the stripping out of our countryside assets, removal of hedgerows, draining of wetlands, removal of woodlands, and then the huge loss of mixed farming because of guaranteed prices and guaranteed markets. And subsequently, so what we've actually seen is the destruction of our soils, the loss of biodiversity of our soils, the foundation of this landscape, so our soils are in a poor condition, mass destruction of biodiversity. Biodiversity is is nowhere. It's hanging on by its fingernails. And I know this because I was deeply immersed in the whole countryside stewardship and environmental stewardship uh, program. Um, the poisoning of our rivers and aquifers. And I use those words carefully because that is a fact. And I can be examined on that as well. The failing to curb the massive climate change gases coming from from uh, agriculture, particularly from nitrates. Um, and of course the big failure, that of um, moving towards sustainable food production. That's the elephant in the room. And I'm afraid I have to add to that the flawed administration of the intervention, public intervention, where we have a threat from Europe constantly over disallowance. And again, I'm sorry to use these terms, and I can explain that if anybody wants to know. So my uh, second question then is, will those who support remaining in Europe, are you really prepared to be very, very active in modernizing the environmental aspects of uh, Europe? That's really important for us. Um, and for example, I think on a small, densely populated island, we might have an agenda for a new directive on multifunctional landscapes about sustainability and about wealth, uh, sorry, about health and well-being. Uh, so we want to move the agenda forward. Are you up for having that debate? And that's a question for Kerry. You've been immensely patient. Um, I must sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, 
Uh, apologies to my phone. I've, uh, the, the Guardian can't stop trying to get hold of me. <laughs> so we've um, thrown it away. Um, we, now, we now come to the, the, the heart of the, the, the meat in the sandwich. And, uh, um, and so, George, I, 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 I've never met you before. Um, you've, uh, you've, you've got a good record as a, as a minister. But now it would seem you've gone completely barking. Um, you are... <laughs> I, if, we didn't, if we didn't have this debate about Europe, you would be arguing that everything which we have should be thrown away and we should start it all again. And if you are, were to argue that, people would just think you're mad. So, please will you tell us why it, is, it makes complete sense for us to dismantle all the air pollution, all the river pollution, all the marine stuff, all the farming stuff, and start again. Could you please give us in ten minutes just a few reasons why... Uh, you are not making figures up out of the blue. You actually had thought this through, and you are going to uh, lead us into a better and a, a better lab. Please tell us. Ten minutes. Right. Well, thank you very much, John, for that uh, kind introduction. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wait till the next one. <laughs> yeah, I really welcome the fact, though, that the Landscape Institute is uh, is organising this debate because, uh, as Merrick said. I think it's fair to say that the environment's not had a fair hearing so far in this debate. It's uh, not featured very prominently in the debate, and I think uh, it's very good that we have this discussion. Um, now, Merrick had uh, touched on a few uh, issues around CAP. I'm not going to cover those issues. We can maybe pick them up in uh, the Q&A later if people want to. But there are two key points that I wanted to make. Firstly, around international wildlife conventions. And secondly, um, the bit that uh, probably is of greatest interest to some of you, um, some of the more domestic legislation we have, uh, much of it inspired by the um, Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive. And firstly, it's important to recognise that a lot of the challenges we have with the environment today are global challenges. Uh, we don't need to be just working within the European Union, we need to be working globally. And this country's got a very proud uh, history when it comes to international wildlife conventions. Uh, we led the way from the 1950s onwards to try to end commercial whaling. Uh, we've tried to bring an end to the ivory trade. We've led the way uh, in bringing an end to the shameful practice uh, of shark fish finning in many parts of the world, and we continue to press this. And we've pressed as well uh, for uh, raising the conservation status, for instance, of polar bears. But the reality is this. Since the Lisbon Treaty was introduced, our position on these international forums has been undermined. Uh, it is now uh, literally uh, against the law, it is unlawful for this country to speak and vote uh, on its own behalf uh, on conventions like CITES, like the Convention on Migratory Species, unless we first get permission from the European Commission. And I've seen uh, the impact of this. When I was at the International Whaling Commission two years ago, uh, there was a discussion about um, uh, you know, what we should be doing on commercial whaling. I felt that we should maybe go a bit further than the EU thought, uh, and officials got in a real flap, very worried about the fact that I wanted to say something a bit more than had been agreed by the Commission. And I said to them, what's the, the problem with this? What, what's the worst that can happen uh, if we uh, were to speak and say, speak up for conservation and um, be closer to, say, New Zealand and, uh, and Australia? So then they explained to me what happened in 2010. And at the CITES Convention, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species in 2010, uh, there was an attempt to curtail uh, trade in the bluefin tuna. Monaco had put a very ambitious uh, motion down. Uh, there was an attempt by uh, the EU, led by the UK, to broker a compromise to get a majority uh, to try to have uh, a, 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 an introduction of a ban, but not immediately. That compromise fell through, which left just the more ambitious Monaco uh, motion left. Now, the EU at that point ordered all EU member states to abstain. The then Labour government, this was in March 2010, the dying days of the last Labour government, under Hillary Benn <coughs> and under Hugh Aranka davis decided to disagree with the Commission. They broke with the Commission and they ordered our officials uh, to side instead with Monaco and the US. But what happened next was absolutely extraordinary. The EU started infraction proceedings against the UK for disobeying EU orders. And when the legal advice came through, we were advised as a government uh, that we um, might have had the moral high ground, but the EU Commission had the letter of the law on their side. So the UK had to apologise to the Commission and give an undertaking never to step out of line again. Now, this is uh, a real problem for me, and I've seen it uh, have impacts on, uh, I in other areas. If you look at the way the rules of procedure on these conventions are going, 
Currently, with the regional fisheries management organisations, um, it's already the case that all 28 EU member states have just one vote between them. So if you look at ICAT, which deals with tuna in the Atlantic, uh, the UK sits there literally on the off chance that one of our overseas territories like Bermuda uh, might want us to speak on their behalf. But it is unlawful for us to speak on our own behalf. Now, this is how ridiculous it has become. Uh, we, uh, we, we sit on some of these conventions uh, by the dint of the fact that we've uh, got some remnant of empire that might want us to speak on, uh, on their behalf, but it's unlawful for us to speak on our, on our own behalf. And uh, this is about to get worse because in February this year, there was a huge row at the Convention on Migratory Species. There was a package uh, which the UK helped put together on sharks, um, and the whole thing was nearly lost because of a massive bust-up between the US and the EU, because the US actually asked a pertinent point. If it is literally unlawful for uh, any member state to disagree with the European Commission, why is it right uh, that the European Union would have a block of 28 votes and the US just one vote? Uh, now, in order to save the day, it was decided that this decision on rules of procedure would be delayed until the CITES Convention uh, in South Africa this September. And what that means is, as, as, re as soon as this September, uh, we could be stripped of our remaining voting rights on those uh, environmental conventions like CITES, like the Convention on Biodiversity, like the Convention on Migratory Species. And this does have real impacts. Uh, we've got a manifesto commitment as Conservatives uh, to improve the conservation status of polar bears. The last time this was uh, attempted, it was at uh, CITES in 2013, uh, there was a bid to try to uh, ban the sale of polar bear skins. And um, that was defeated for one reason only. The EU ordered all its member states to abstain. The UK supported the US uh, and others. Uh, Germany supported the US and others. A lot of EU member states did. And it was narrowly defeated by about four votes, literally because the European Union abstained in that vote. And the reason they abstained is because uh, Denmark and some of the Nordic countries uh, couldn't agree. And the reason Denmark and some of the Nordic countries couldn't agree is because Greenland uh, didn't agree. I see this as well sometimes on the whaling conventions. It's extraordinary that Greenland, which is not in the EU, actually tempers the position that the EU takes on commercial whaling. So I believe that we would do far, far better if we could take control uh, in those uh, international conventions. If we left the EU, we would regain our seat. We would be free to speak again on those international issues. The second uh, issue I want to touch on is the domestic legislation. And um, just to, to clear things up, if we left the European Union, we would still remain signatories to the Berne Convention. And it is the Berne Convention that actually underpins the Habitats Directives and the Birds Directives. Those directives were actually introduced by the EU as a means of delivering member states' commitment to the Berne Convention. And until the late 1970s, the then Labour government had the view that actually the environment should remain a national competence and that we should make our commitments internationally through things like the Berne Convention. Um, and there are some problems with the way uh, the existing directives work. Firstly, they're very bureaucratic. And uh, I see this constantly in the department huge strategy documents that we have to produce, uh, pointless strategy documents for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, for instance. Uh, I've seen the Marine Spatial Planning Directive. Spatial planning is an idea that this country invented. Uh, the EU then decided to take it and make it its own. Now we have to produce lots and lots of voluminous reports. We've got officials uh, wasting huge amounts of time producing uh, pointless reports. The second thing about these directives is they become very litigious. It's good for lawyers. Um, and I can give you some examples. Um, the Bolton Fell Moss in Cumbria. Um, the last Labour government uh, believed that we had done all that we could to designate um, uh, peat bog habitats, but there was pressure from the European Union and some NGOs to go further. Everybody knew at the time that the Bolton Fell Moss was a difficult site to make work. Uh, it's only a site of about 200 uh, acres. But uh, over the last five years, this country spent around £25 million pounds, uh, trying to designate the Bolton Fell Moss as a peat bog. Uh, we could have spent that money on better things, but the money's gone on compensation, on lawyers, on uh, compulsory purchase orders, uh, all of it completely pointless, very litigious. We spend far too much money uh, fighting through the courts and lawyers and compensation uh, because of the clunky nature of these directives. The, uh, third thing that I'd say about the directives, 
is that there's an overemphasis, in my view, on uh, spatial protection. And we see this particularly in the marine environment. Uh, it encourages us to do huge amounts of bureaucratic work to effectively draw lines on maps, uh, but which then don't actually have a great deal of meaning. And I've seen this recently in the case of protections for harbour porpoise. We'd been looking as a country at how we could really protect harbour porpoise. The main threat to them is uh, bycatch. Uh, in, in fishing nets. And pingers have come on quite a long way. These are the sort of pingers you can put on drift nets uh, to repel uh, cetaceans, to keep them away, to prevent that bycatch. That would be the way to really protect harbour porpoise, would be technical measures through the fishing industry. Instead, uh, we've been forced, again, because an NGO went to the European Commission, we've been forced to start drawing huge lines on maps to create some theoretical spatial protection for harbour porpoise, which actually, at the end of the day, won't really mean um, very much. The final thing about the directives is that there's a sort of irreversible nature of them, that once you've done something, you're locked into it, and if it doesn't work or if the evidence changes, it's very difficult uh, to change things. And we've seen this, for instance, with the nitrates directive. All the scientists would uh, tell you that the nitrates directive is hopelessly out of date. In many ways, the... Uh, the Water Framework Directive has superseded it, but we are still under pressure to designate new areas as nitrogen vulnerable zones, even though the science now tells us that actually phosphates are far more important to uh, the eutrophication of water courses than nitrates. So for all of these reasons, I actually think we could do far better uh, if we took back control uh, and made the laws ourselves. It would be uh, more flexible, we could actually do things. And I, I don't accept this idea that good things only happen for the environment when we're told to do it by an outside force. People have got to have some more confidence uh, in the public. If you look at groups like the RSPB, they've got a membership of a million people. Uh, the Wildlife Trust have got membership of nearly a million. This country's passionate uh, about the environment. And if we took back control, we would take back responsibility. And if you look at um, other countries uh, who are not in the EU, uh, some of them actually do quite well for the environment. If you look at water quality, the two European countries that have got the best water quality, Norway and Switzerland, they take their responsibilities seriously, they take ownership uh, of their environment and they deliver for it. So in conclusion, I am absolutely certain that we could do better. To answer Merrick's point, um, if we left the EU, um, the directives would go. And I know some of the comments I made in The Guardian earlier in the week were largely misunderstood. When I say that these are <laughs> spirit-crushing regulations, uh, what I mean is it is spirit-crushing that I have officials in my department that spend thousands and thousands of hours doing pointless work for the EU when they could be doing good work uh, for the environment. And it is spirit-crushing that this country uh, spends millions and millions of pounds uh, on legal fees and lawyers fighting stuff through the courts uh, arguing over the technical detail of this clause in the EU law or that clause in the EU law when we could be spending that money to do genuine projects um, for the environment. And if we left the EU, yes, those directives would go. But the national regulations that we've put in place would be underpinned by our international commitments to the Berne Convention. Where those national regulations were not delivering effectively for the environment, we'd be free to change them without some threat of legal challenge from the European Commission. Uh, we could build on them, we could experiment with new things, try new ideas, uh, safe in the knowledge that if it didn't quite work out, well, we could change things. But at the moment, uh, we're stuck in this very rigid structure which prevents us from truly delivering for the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um, the directives would go, I mean, like, air pollution, uh, I mean, where do we stop? I mean, it, it, the point is, can you in any way guarantee that we would have the same protection or better protection at any point? That's the question which you, know, you put to those others. Um, it's kind of babies and bathwater, isn't it? I mean, you, you made some very good points about sort of small things, as if to say the whole thing is horrid. But do not accept that, uh, that successive governments and NGOs have worked fantastically hard to get these... Uh, directives into place and to make them work? Well, as I said at the end, um, the national legislation that has been inspired by the Berne Convention uh, and prescribed by uh, the directives, that national legislation would stay in place. But you'd be free to improve it. And uh, if you but had second-rate legislation in places that wasn't working, well, you'd be free to change that. And I think this is the important thing. So the, the answer is, would you have a more coherent public policy if we took back control? Absolutely, yes. That's a no-brainer. 
Uh, the idea that uh, you need a pan-European legal system in order to get coherent policy is just plain wrong, in my view. Okay. Here's a government which has fought madly against uh, regulation about air, regulation about water, regulation about beaches. Britain was the dirty man of Europe. You resisted for years and years and years. Uh, I, I, can you understand that not many people here may have your faith that a new government would actually protect in the same way. I'll just leave you with that, and I'm going to go straight, straight on to, <laughs> to, to Kerry. <laughs> Kerry, you've got just as many questions to answer. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, so some of Kerry's background, um, um, she was a lawyer, which is probably a very good thing. Um, and um, Bristol um, worked, I gather, for Keep Britain in Europe? No, Keep no it's Britain in Europe. Britain in Which Europe, is, okay. Yeah. Um, and then left there. <laughs> and, um, uh, Europe hasn't worked that well, has it? I mean, to be fair, um, you know, over the last you know, 10, 15 years, the environment has gone pretty well downhill. Um, it's not just because of the, of, of the Conservative Party. Labour, very, very uh, responsible as well. Go and give us 10 minutes, say, go and give us, give us 10 minutes about why, of why we're better off as we are. Right, OK. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I would start by saying that I think so far much of the um, the thrust of the Brexit campaign, the, the Leave campaign, has been very much based on empty promises about what would happen if we were to leave the EU. Um, there's this sort of mythical idea that we would be able to do anything we liked as a country and they would all be terribly nice things, even though quite a lot of the campaigners involved um, have been in the forefront of doing not so nice things um, during their, their time in government. So I, that's my starting point, very sceptical about um, what sort of government, national government, we would have if they were freed from EU constraints. The most reliable indication of what Brexit would look like um, for our environment is to look at what the EU has already achieved. And it's easy to forget that we were once described as the dirty man of Europe, and um, we used to be worried about the threat of acid rain here. Um, our sulphur emissions, our sulphur dioxide emissions, fell by 89% between 1990 and 2010 our nitrogen dioxide emissions were down 62%, and that is because of EU directives. Um, the EU ban on leaded petrol as well, and the requirement for catalytic <coughs> converters in cars. It's a very obvious example of how the EU intervening. Um, George was talking about how um, Norway and Switzerland have the best water quality in, in Europe, uh, as if the, if the UK was to leave Europe, we would also be able to pursue this path towards having equally good water quality. But we used to allow untreated sewage to flow into our seas before the EU bathing water directive forced the UK government to make our bathing waters fit for purpose, or fit for swimming in, and to test for bacteria like E. coli. It wasn't that the EU was preventing us from doing that, it was the EU that forced us to do that. In 1990, just 27% of our bathing waters met minimum mandatory standards. By 2014, 99% complied. And the EU's waste framework directive has been the driving force behind our domestic waste policy, requiring us to recycle 50% of household waste by 2020. The landfill directive has seen our municipal waste recycling go up from 12% in 2001 to 39% in 2010. The floods directive requires EU states to assess all water courses and coastlines for flood risk. And of course then there's the whole, um, the role that the EU has played in making sure that climate change is on the international agenda, key role in the run-up to Kyoto and also in the run-up to the um, Paris Agreement. Perhaps most importantly and perhaps most relevant to your work is the, uh, the nature directives which protect our threatened habitats and birds as we've already heard. Um, before the directives the UK was losing 15% of protected sites each year and this is now down to 1%. There's, under the Habitats to Protective, uh, sorry, Directive, sites like the Brecon Beacons, the North Antrim Coast, Ben Nevis, the New Forest, Robin Hood's Bay, they've been designated European Special Areas of Conservation to protect them. And George Osborne, before his recent conversion to being a Remain campaigner and therefore far more enthusiastic about the European Union, tried to claim that these protections have placed ridiculous costs on British businesses. But the government's own review then showed that this was not, in fact, the case. 
Um, there is still concern, though, that the directives are under threat, and one part of my role, and this partly goes towards the question that Merritt posed, is to try to ensure that the UK is not playing a negative role as those directives come up for re review in the EU, and we are arguing for them to be retained and indeed to be strengthened. And perhaps, yes, yes, you know, I acknowledge that sometimes the implementation of these rules can be over bureaucratic, although I don't think that's something that's confined to the EU. If you, uh, uh, I was in a uh, councillor for five years, if you look at the way local government functions, that great big strategy documents that don't say very much is certainly not something that is confined to Brussels. It's, it's something that unfortunately is endemic in the public realm and it's something we need to tackle. Um, in the largest response ever to an EU consultation, more than half a million people called for the nature laws to be kept and to be better enforced. And more than 100,000 of those responses came from UK citizens. And that's partly because of organisations like the RSPB mobilising its members um, to defend the directives. But it's not just about defending them in the UK, it is about defending them across Europe. If you look at um, the some specific examples of where the directives have been effective. You know, I'm a Bristol MP. We've been looking for years at whether we can harness the tidal power in the Severn Estuary. But we are very much aware, you know, there's, there's questions about, well, the, the sheer cost of the project. Um, there's questions about the impact on the port. Um, but there's also the, the nature directives protecting the Severn Estuary, very important wetlands, um, the Avon Gorge and or the, well, the estuary is a seven a special area of conservation and a special protection area. And some might argue, well, this is standing in the way of progress of development and good development in terms of uh, harnessing renewable energy. But it, I think it is also important that we do protect those sites, we do protect the, the, the wetlands as well. Um, and th and Thanks to the directive, we've seen a strategic approach to mitigating disturbance from housing developments. You look at the um, Salisbury Plain, for example. You look at the impact the directives have had on flood protection for threatened sites like Minsmere and Titchwell. And there's all, the directive is also important when it comes to wind farms, uh, the siting of onshore and offshore wind farms. The difficulty, I think, as Merrick was said, that it can be quite difficult to um, place a cost on the environmental benefits to the EU. A lot of the debate so far around Brexit has been very transactional. It's you will be X amount better off or you'll pay an X amount into the EU. And it's all about numbers and people I know from talking to um, my constituents are just very confused as to who to believe. Um, but also, I think some of the debates that I've done, particularly with younger people, they don't really want it to be about that, you know, am I better off, you know, am, am, I, am I better off in financial terms? They want it to be about a more inspiring vision about the type of Europe we want to see or the type of Britain that we would achieve if we weren't in the EU. And I think that's where the environment is. Uh, I, I enjoy far more talking about the environmental case than I do um, some of those transactional debates. And although it is difficult to put a cost on, I'm now going to try and do to a small extent. We know that the birds and habitats directives contribute um, between 200 to 300 billion euros to the European economy each year in terms of natural services and tourism. DEFRA estimates that even the very limited plans to comply with EU air quality directives. And my view is that we should be doing a lot more to ensure clean air in this country. But even the very limited steps that DEFRA are taking will produce a net financial benefit of £2.9 billion because of the impact on health and improved fuel efficiency. The UK seaside economy, um, which of course is very closely linked to having beaches that you actually dare to uh, uh, sorry, be beaches that you dare to tread on and swims that you dare to see to swim in is now worth 3.6 billion pounds a year and the Environment Agency has estimated that the Water Framework Directive could have a net benefit to England and Wales of nearly 9 billion pounds and the EU Circular Economy Package which I think is one of the most important things certainly in terms of my brief to have come out of Europe recently um, if it is properly implemented, which is quite a big if because the UK has been playing a fairly negative role during the discussions, the fact that you know, they've been arguing against uh, setting uh, statutory targets or mandatory targets in the package, they argued for food waste to be removed from the package. But if it was properly implemented in this country, it could actually be a huge boost for new jobs and innovative new businesses trying to address that reuse, recycling, waste reduction agenda. 
And there is also our scientific research based, which um, has benefited hugely from EU investment. I was in Plymouth recently at the Marine um, Science Lab. Uh, Plymouth, I mean, Plymouth particularly, but the UK are the world leaders in terms of marine biology and research on that front. As I was there sitting in a meeting, they suddenly got word that they'd got a six-figure EU grant to fund some of their work. Um, and it's a rollover, so every few years they would hope to be getting this six-figure six sum. Their concern is that that would be totally at risk if we were to leave the EU, because if we're not willing to participate in EU research projects, why would we just want to? Why would they want to give us the money rather than their competitors in other EU countries? Um, and that's true. I was at Harper Adams, the Agricultural University, a few days ago as well. Sim similar story there. The Met Office received £2.3 million pounds from the EU in 2014. That's obviously really important work on climate modelling, um, which potentially is at risk. So to come on to agriculture and CAP, um, I think the, with the questions posed by Merit, I would argue that you seem to be saying, I, I agree, I think, with your analysis of um, where we are in terms of, you know, th there's a real problem with um, the economic viability of the farming industry in this country. And you can go around and, you know, we know that dairy farmers, dairy fa a dairy farmer would struggle to produce milk for less than 28p a litre. And the price now is dipping below 20 pence a litre in terms of what the wholesalers will pay them for it. Um, organic, you can make money, um, costs a bit more to produce, but you can get twice the price. Um, I've been to, you know, I went to a potato farmer the other day, was losing more than a hundred pound a ton I think on its potatoes and um, had decided to stop potato farming and was go going into growing crops for anaerobic digestion instead so that's when you see the countryside um, covered with fields of maize rather than that mixed farming you know pig farmers will lose money if they sell to supermarkets there, there are very few sectors apart from the niche sectors that aren't um, struggling to get by I would say that's not because of cap indeed some 55% of farmers' incomes come from EU subsidies. They would simply not exist without those subsidies. And if we were to leave the EU, it's all well and good for George to say, well, we would meet those subsidies, we would pay it. But we know the other pressures on the public purse. And farmers are incredibly worried about what would happen if those subsidies were removed. So I would argue that it, it's, it's the, as much about the market as it is about the impact of... Um, the common agricultural policy. Where I do think you're right, though, is that perhaps CAP has failed to address those issues in the way that it could have done. But, I mean, one of the, without getting too techy on CAP, there is, pillar two is focused on rural development, so that's more the, the environmental benefit side of things. <coughs> the UK government argued against 15% of the subsidies being spent on pillar two, and in the UK, only 12.5% is spent on, on pillar two, so on those environmental goods. So I think that gives an indication of where the government would be if it was left to its own devices, whether you know, it would be arguing for even less to be spent on that. The a 2012 study for the European Commission, before the latest reforms came into place, did acknowledge that CAP had contributed to the modernisation and intensification of agriculture, which in turn contributed to landscape homogenisation and the decline of traditional features like hedges, trees and wet areas, which is the, the concerns you were raising. But it did also find that CAP payments had contributed to the conservation of traditional rural landscapes with agri-environment schemes, including support for hedgerows and cross-compliance measures supporting high-value farming systems that benefit the landscape. And of course, if we were to lift Pillar 2 up to 15% from 12.5%, we would be able to do more of that work. Um, the three crop rule, which I know some farmers don't agree with, but that is intended to prevent monoculture. Um, and that would hopefully improve the diversity of our landscape as well as biodiversity. And the countryside stewardship scheme includes incentive for land managers to preserve features important to the history of the rural landscape. So just to sort of final, final stint about the risks <coughs> under Brexit, I think there's no evidence to support any Brexit claims that they would protect the environment if they leave. In fact, the current government and the coalition government have desperately tried to evade and undermine EU protections. So if it was the uh, even more, um, let's say, right-wing elements of that government that was, was left in charge after Brexit, 
I think we would have to be even more sceptical about that. Um, Boris Johnson was down in Ramsgate recently saying we will ban live exports the day after Brexit. Well, actually, Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark tried to introduce um, a lower limit on live transit times. They tried to reduce it down to eight hours um, in 2015. The UK wouldn't sign up to that. So if they won't sign up to a measure that's just trying to make live transit you know, shorter times, why would they scrap it altogether? Um, we've seen with um, bees, uh, the neonicotinoids thing, and uh, people, well, a little, Jeremy Corbyn mentioned this in his speech on Thursday, people saying, why are you talking about bees? You know, that, that's ridiculous. I've actually had, I would say, not even 20 emails about the EU <coughs> referendum campaign, um, which is slightly surprising. Um, but I only ever, whenever we're discussing the EU, I, I might get half a dozen emails. I had, I think, 800 on bees and the neonicotinoids ban. So that's the EU trying to ban neonicotinoids, which are deemed to be harmful to bees and other pollinators. It's the UK that is arguing for derogation from that. So again, th th I would question whether that means the, it would be safe in the UK hands. And what often happens is the government tends to use the EU as an excuse for not doing things it doesn't want to do. So I introduced a food waste bill, um, I, I introduced one last year but I introduced one in 2012 and I was told by the then farming minister, the guy who had George's job, we're not allowed to um, introduce these rules because the EU won't let us um, it, under their food safety laws. And I went away and got two legal opinions which said that was nonsense and we've now seen that France has introduced a food waste law, for example, I think Italy's doing the same. Wild animals in circuses, we were told, yeah, there's only about 20 something, 22, 26 wild animals left in circuses in the UK. The government has been promising for several years under pressure from its own backbenchers that it will ban them. And again, to start with, they were saying the EU won't let us do it. It'd have to be done at an EU level. There are now 17 EU countries that have got a full ban or a partial ban, and the UK is still not doing it. So again, you know, they may not be the biggest issues, but it's just an example of we don't necessarily believe that the EU is trying to stop us doing things. It's quite often things that um, we wouldn't do, um, we, that the government just simply doesn't have the political will to do. And if you look at the clean air laws, the government has actually been taken to court by client earth. The Supreme Court has found that we are in breach of EU clean air laws. And it's only then that the government has come up with this very limited plan to um, introduce clean air zones in five cities as, uh, outside London. As I said, I think we need to go a lot further. They've also been taken to court by WWF and the Anglin Trust over their failure to protect our rivers, lakes and coastal areas from agricultural pollution. Um, they've de-designated some beaches so that they aren't covered by the, the EU rules on that front. So I, don't, I simply don't think that they would protect us in the way that the EU has protected us when our own government fails to act. Um, I think I will conclude on that. But I think I, I, the final point I would say, the EU, you know, people tend to talk about it as though it has a life of its own. The EU is basically as good as the governments which make up the EU. So there will be times when the UK is, as I would say, you know, obviously being a Labour politician, playing a progressive role, driving the agenda forward, and we're the ones that are bringing other EU countries on board. There will be other times when we're lagging behind, and I believe very much that that is the case at the moment. But what I think is crucial is that rather than have our environment subject to the vagaries of national governments. The fact that you've achieved and gone to quite considerable lengths to try to achieve consensus across the EU and sign up to these directives and, and other rules at least locks it in. It locks in that protection, so it's very difficult for national governments to dismantle them. What we need to see, though, is um, a situation where it also becomes easier to improve those directives, which I think is part of the challenge that was put to me, but that's, that's certainly something I think that, um, you know, if there was a Labour government, then that would be uh, a very important task for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kerry, Terry, thanks very much indeed. I, you, you won't mind my asking. We, we give something like three, sorry, three and a half billion pounds goes on cap. Okay, this money would come back to Britain, wouldn't it? <laughs> This money would be, could be therefore well, used, as George says, for the betterment of it. How well, are you going to know? How can you justify that most of this money goes to very rich farmers who've basically been buggering up the landscape for a long time? 
Well, I, th I think um, there's two separate questions there. One is you can't really just look at it in a simple form of how much you pay in and how much you get back because there's also the additional benefits of being able to trade without tariffs, um, you know, access to a market of 500 million consumers. So it's, and this is, you know, the, the, the lines with the Brexit going around with their bus saying it costs us X amount uh, per week to be in the EU. You just can't look at it in those terms. So that would be the first thing. And the NFU has come out and said that it is in in favour of Remain, um, NFU Scotland has as, as well because they they recognise the, the at the moment, you know, particularly as I outlined some of the, um, the the struggles that farmers are going through to make a living, the last thing you need is uncertainty about your, your future. It's difficult enough having to cope with weather and the market volatility and all those things without having to worry about um, suddenly changes to your um, the subsidy system as well. Um, the other thing I would say, I think there, yeah, there, there is very clearly a job to be done looking at who gets the subsidies and what they get it for doing um, and how we can recalibrate caps so that people get it for the environmental goods or the public goods or you know um, things like that one of the when Jeremy was running for the leadership one of the things he mentioned I think he had a rural um, manifesto was a, a cap an upper limit a cap on cap mm. so maybe fixed at 300,000 euros so that you don't get people um, yeah, yes, taken in huge amounts. The other thing I would say, I, I've been pushing for a long time to try and get more transparency about who gets which payments. <laughs> so one of the things, in the Register of Members' Interests in Parliament, we have to declare every source of income. Um, so if we, get rent, if we rent out property, if we've got directorships, if we've got other jobs, you've got some people that are working as lawyers or GPs, you don't have to declare your cap payments. Cause, <laughs> and, and actually, you know, looking at how many DEFRA ministers in the past have been in receipt of very substantial um, EU subsidies. Mm -hmm. I think that that should be transparent so that we know, yeah. Okay, no, totally good. Okay, so we've had two passionate debates either side. Very well put, very well put. Um, now, let's have the balance. Let's have the... <laughs> <laughs> and your president-elect is, is here himself. So, uh, Noel Farrer. And, uh, um, we are running very late, aren't we? Uh, so, I will be very quick um, uh, to try and tie this up because I think the Q&A, which John will chair, uh, with George and Kerry is more important perhaps than what I am going to say and that would interest me and I have a very dubious track record first of, of living within our charitable laws and all the rest of it. The, I have a personal view on things which I might be sharing now um, and uh, but that is not I hereby declare the uh, position of the Landscape <coughs> Institute as a charitable body which will remain fair and unbiased in this debate. Um, I think the most important thing, firstly, is, is it is really interesting that environment has simply not hit the agenda at all in this debate up until now. Um, but I think that's been the issue for my entire presidency of the Landscape Institute over the last two years. The simple process of raising the awareness of environment as an important issue seems to me needs to sit at the forefront. Only when we've decided that we can get it to where it needs to be can you then start making decisions upon which, whether we should be in or out of the EU and what balance on balance does environment have with that? I attended the IFLA con uh, conference, which is the World uh, Landscape Institute Convention, uh, not very long ago. And what's very interesting is, is that <coughs> environment needs to come up the agenda. It cannot be about economics. It cannot be about migrate, immigration. These things are relatively unimportant. The profound changes that are happening in our world that we are making, the marks we are making, infrastructure marks, housing marks, uh, all the marks that we're going to make, the changes that we make, are all m the profound pieces of the environmental jigsaw that we have to in some way realise. It's these changes that effectively are what politics is all about. All they're trying to do is marshal these changes and these changes start with the environment. At IFLA, what was clear is all the countries of the world are feeling that we have moved from a position of where man has been able to work for thousands of years up until very recently with nature. And we're now getting to a point now, all of a sudden, and it wasn't at the Industrial Revolution where all of a sudden we changed the rule book. It's been since about 1960 that we've moved from a place where we are working with nature to profoundly damaging nature. Um, we have lost 40% of our biodiversity and species across the planet. 40% of the species on the planet we have lost since 1970. We actually produce 
So we talk about this neoliberalist context around free market economies driving food production, driving how we need to deal with uh, our natural systems and our landscapes. The reality is, is that the world produces enough food to feed 12 billion people. The world will never, even after 2050, have a population of more than 10 billion people. The reality is, is that we throw 40% of all of the food that we produce away. We have only 7.4 billion people on the planet today, of which 1.2 billion are in starvation, and another billion are affected and upset by war and strife. What we have is a world where the debate has said it about the EU, which is around economy, and it's around personal gain, it's around individual countries, and it's around me, not us. And that, I feel, sits at the core as to why environment has really struggled in the debate. I have made I meant a number of, I, I know you've all read the background notes in terms of what I was going to say, but in a way, I'm just going to read them to you because I think they make my point very clearly for me. Um, I consider that the EU directives on waste, recycling, fishing, pollution, and all the others should rightly be made above national politics, where the need of individual countries would simply have not allowed these laws to be passed. I don't believe, and I understand, I can't see really that. Um, uh, we would, on our own, have said, you have to hit 20% recycling by this time. You must do this to your water strategies. You must do this to your... We simply wouldn't pass. Why would we, when we're thinking about ourselves, disadvantage ourselves economically in that way? Is it appropriate at that level that we would do that? I always use the example of Brazil. Brazil might turn around, as it happens, it may be going to a bit of a decline at the moment. Brazil, historically, its major export has been timber. But recently, it has realised, hang on a minute, I need to take a responsible approach to what's happening in the rainforest in my country. But Brazil might turn around and say one day, hang on a minute, there's a cash crop to be had here. We're going to carry on chopping it down. If we take a principled line that is, as a country somewhere else in the world, what right have I got to say to Brazil? If it's an individual country, what right have I got to say to them, actually, can you, can you not do that? Can you not do that? We are all joined. It's joined, we are joined up. If they chop the rainforest down, we all suffer. It may not be democratic, but I want to be able to say to Brazil, and more importantly than that, I want to be able to have leverage over Brazil such that I can say, don't do that. And I think whilst I would love better pan-world organisations to exist, the reality is, is the EU is a poor beast at trying to hold 28 countries together. I totally accept that. George's and Kerry's points, really getting, digging into the detail of the bureaucracy, of the difficulties of directives, the entire piece is profoundly tough, it's profoundly complex, it has people feeding off of it, whether it's lawyers and time, it has all of that complexity. But that does not mean that the fundamental underlying principle behind what they are trying to do is right. A federalist approach must be one whereby these types of decisions, which are not going to be taken at the national level for and on the benefit of the environment, they will be taken and are rightly should be taken at another level. How can we make that democratic? How can we make that level work such that it doesn't bump into individual countries being able to have their distinctiveness, their individual character, their freedoms to be able to make the choices that they want at that time? So. That, for me, is a key principle, which means that in, but it's about reform. This debate about in and out means we don't talk about the real debate, which is surely about reform and making it better, not getting out. Thank you. No, thank you very much. <laughs> and Noel's other points are very well put here as well, so, uh, so <laughs> I, won't, I won't read them out. But, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so your turn. Keep your questions short, uh, pose them directly to them, and if both, both of you could please answer yeah. quite shortly as well. Okay, <coughs> one in the front to start. Hi, I'm Phil Mulligan, I'm the Chief Executive of the Landscape Institute. Uh, George, I thought that was the best speech I've heard yet on uh, leaving, and it's a shame that those sort of <coughs> arguments haven't had more airplay. I thought you, you came across very genuinely, passionately motivated, and, and that's really refreshing to hear. However, um, the idea to leave because we want to be free, we don't want to be constrained, we want to be able to uh, not be constrained in these conventions. I mean, the same could apply to the UN. 
um, and yet it would be a nonsense to say we should leave the UN. Um, there are clearly some issues that are cross-border and that require a multilateral response, and surely the thing to do, as we do in the UN, by providing diplomats and civil servants, is to work for the best possible conventions and outcomes within blocks like the EU, because there are these, these uh, multilateral solutions are required. So why is it better to leave a block like that than to do what we do within the UN by providing our expertise and resources to try and get the best possible outcome? Um, I think what I'm saying is I'd like it to be like the UN, where the UK is free to build coalitions. And of course, in practice, what you do is, uh, yes, uh, if we were on CITES and there was a discussion around uh, improving protection for polar bears, uh, we would work and cooperate with all the other European countries and seek to get them to support our position. We'd talk to the US. Uh, we would talk to uh, all the other countries that had an interest in that. But what happens at the moment is we don't have that... Um, we don't have that voice. It is a, it's against the law for us to do what we do in the, in the UN, because under the rules of procedure uh, that we have since the Lisbon Treaty, the UK has to get permission from the European Commission before it can speak. And that is why, uh, when we tried to raise protection for polar bears in 2013, it was basically struck down by the European Union. And the other point is this, um, never mind having a vote, uh, a seat at the table. Um, I mean, get this, at the moment, um, on, on ones where there's a shared competence, what's called a shared competence with most of the environmental ones, not the fisheries ones, uh, while it's against the law for us to speak independently, um, we at least have a vote along with the other 28 member states. There's a block vote of 28. Now the argument, and I understand it, is well if you can sort of stitch up the EU position, and the UK is usually quite influential, you can get that block vote of 28. But this, the way that things are going, as I was trying to explain, I know it's quite complicated, but the way things are heading uh, is that because of the row at the Convention on Migration Species on February, the US and other countries are now saying that the EU should have one vote for all 28 member states. That means that ev all 28 member states of the EU will have the same voting right collectively uh, as, America. as Monaco. As America. And Monaco, yeah. As America. Uh, but at the moment we've got 28. No, so why, don't we, why, wouldn't we, why wouldn't we want to be... <laughs> but why wouldn't we want to be an independent... But I, I mean, is it a good thing that the, that the EU now is going to have its voting rights destroyed and taken away? I think that's wrong. The, the right thing would be for us to have our own seat at the table and cooperate around the world. And, you know, when it comes to uh, whaling, for instance, we've got a lot in common with the South American countries. Yeah. Um, and we could work with them freely. But at the moment, we're not, we're not allowed to. We're bound. And it's literally, again, I mean, I, I'm not making it up. It is literally but against the law. Let's, let's move on a little bit from CITES and some of these other things. Any, any other questions here? OK, one, actually, one, one over there on the right, please. While we're waiting, George, I mean, it, it, Britain plays an enormous role behind the scenes. I mean, Thank you. Um, that that you, you, you stitch up most of the, uh, the wildlife stuff anyway. It's, it's, uh, and, and you but that, but that's, no, that won't be any use if we're going to lose the voting rights, if the EU is going to lose all its voting rights. It, it, it seems to me that if you stayed, you would have even more influence. Yes, anyway, um, okay, sorry. I just wanted, it's a quick question, really. Um, why do you think polar bears are more important than bees for the UK environment? <laughs> Okay, question. Can you, can you answer very shortly why are polar bears more important than bees? Uh, I'm not sure. I said they were. I you did, did you not say they were? Uh, I don't think, no. I don't think I said polar bears are more important than bees. I don't know where what that idea came from. What did you say? Well, it's what you were talking about saying. I was using, I was using the polar bears as, as an example uh, of how um, the UK is being stripped of its voting rights on international wildlife conventions. And I think that's wrong. I think the UK should, should be able to build coalitions around the world with South America. Why should the UK We do advocate for the protection of bees. Why, why <laughs> we have a we have a national pollinator strategy. We're putting. Uh, sorry, I don't know where I, I didn't say that polar bears are more important than uh, bees. No, 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 I'm no, passionate no, about no, our environment. Uh, you were, you know, you were very passionate <coughs> about the race of polar bears. But we've been seeing examples of inaction from the protection of bees. And. Right. Well, we've got a national pollinator strategy, and we're putting a lot of, of, of money into uh, protecting bees, and we've got a, quite a robust regulatory regime. So, I mean, I recently, for instance, there was an application for an emergency 
um, an emergency application to use neonicotinoids this year, I struck that down because the scientific advice was that we shouldn't allow that application. So we have a science-based, evidence-based approach to decisions on pesticides, uh, and that is why I, um, you know, last year when there was a very limited application, um, the recommendation from our chief scientific committee was that we should allow that, so we did. Uh, this year, the recommendation, because it was a larger application, was that, that was, uh, we should take a more cautionary approach because uh, uh, it was a bigger application, it wasn't controlled enough, so we struck that down, and I'm the, I'm the one who rejected that application. But, okay, but, oh, sorry, well, can I just say, but generally <coughs> speaking, I mean, that's, that's in terms of specific applications for derogation from the EU ban, but when it came to the EU discussing a ban on neonicotinoids, um, the UK was arguing against it. Um, so that, which was the point I was making, they were arguing against that. And there's, there's something, the precautionary principle, which is you know, the idea that if you, know, you, you err on the side of caution, if you think there's a potential danger, and this government has argued very much against that being implemented, um, whereas I would, and, and that, that's, that's fundamental to the, the debate about neonicotinoids, I would argue that the precautionary principle is a, is a very good principle to follow. Okay, very good. Okay, one, one here just on your right, please. Uh, Robert Hilden, I teach professional studies. I think they can hear me. Um, I, when asked what happens if we leave the European, two to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June, my response is for two years, no change, well, at least while we negotiate with withdrawal. Then, no change until the four governments, not just the white four government, uh, change should they so wish transposition legislation. Then, if we join the single market on the same basis as Norway or uh, Switzerland, uh, no, ch no further change because it has to be a, a, a common playing field, a flat playing field. Where am I right? Where am I wrong? Yeah, you're broadly speaking right, is what I, what I set out. So there will be a, there's a two year negotiation period when we remain in the EU. Um, then, when we do eventually leave, yes, the legal, <coughs> the legal authority of those directives goes, that, that, that falls away. But as I made clear, um, the national legislation, the transposition legislation, as you say, that's been put in place, uh, you, would, you would retain that because it's delivering our uh, commitments, our international commitments under the Berne Convention and other such international conventions. So the model would change. You wouldn't have a uh, bureaucratic regulatory regime in Brussels dictating everything and creating a sort of uh, a paradise for lawyers to argue over the detail. What you'd have instead is, is international commitments through things like the Berne Convention and then national legislation. But not much, not much will change because you know, the, the, a lot of the legislation we've got is about delivering the Berne Convention objectives. Phew, nothing will change. Sorry, we've got three, four more questions, that's all. Okay, hi. Um, I think as EU, as, as part of Europe, one of the, the things I love is that we share knowledge. And you talked about Plymouth and the research there. And without countries, there's no progression. I think if we do not think, sorry about me, um, do you not think that if we, if we just look inward, as much as we don't like being told what, what to do, actually sometimes a kick up the backside pushes us and progresses us. And sh it's, you know, sharing that lot knowledge, you know, I was talking about green roofs and suds. England, we've known about that. Germany, they, they've been so much more advanced and progressive. And we, we sort of, the idea that we might have to change things is, is a major struggle for us. We're still backward in it. And do you not think that, you know, with that slight impetus, as I said, the kick up the bum from Europe, that that will ultimately progress us, even if we don't like it and even if we make mistakes? Do you not think that ultimately <coughs> the environment doesn't end at the British borders? It goes much more. We talk about corridors and biodiversity. Well, we should be linking countries, not just towns and hedgerows. It's a much bigger picture. So, anyway, that's yeah. my George, research. George, do you think, in short, do you think you need to kick up the bum? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would say two things. Um, first is the environment doesn't stop at Europe either. And one of the points I was making is that we can project British soft power internationally on these other wildlife conventions and international conventions more effectively. The second thing is, fundamentally, the argument that some people make is effectively this, that environmental protection is incompatible with democratic self-government. And I just think that's a deeply unattractive argument. I don't agree with that. Uh, I think there are many countries that are self-governing independent countries 
that play a proactive role globally for the environment, working on all those in, um, international conventions, but they don't have to um, give up the ability to make their own laws to do that. So I, <clears throat> I don't accept that fundamental principle. I think this country is passionate about the environment. We lead environmental improvement on many of these uh, conventions. And we should have a bit more faith uh, in the public because they do care about our environment. That's why uh, the RSPB has got a million members and why so many others have got uh, such strong membership. And that's perhaps why all the NGOs and the <coughs> House of Commons Audit Committee think that staying in would make much better sense for the environment. Perhaps. Anyway, uh, well, I disagree. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> self -evident. Ian Phillips, Vice President of the Landscape Institute. Um, given that the good husbandry of the natural environment is probably a good thing and in the, the broader social interest, and I think most people are signed up to that, and given that there is a historical tension or conflict between market forces and the good husbandry of the natural environment. Is there a risk that should we leave um, the market forces and the forces of deregulation might gain the upper hand to the detriment of the natural environment? Kerry, could you come in on that? Well, I think that's pretty much what I, I was saying, yeah. Yeah, I think that you do need a degree of regulation because otherwise if you leave everything to market forces I mean it's the same as, as Merrick was saying yeah and particularly you know, on the, the the farming front this push you can understand the response of farmers if you can't get a decent price for your product to push towards industrialization intensification but I don't think that's what the public want it's not good for the environment it's not good for animal welfare and we should be trying to do what we can to um, support farmers who want to pursue a more sustainable <coughs> route. But you don't do that without um, some degree of, you know, the, the, the yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> um, the, uh, I, won't, I won't repeat what he said, but some, some form of intervention. And, um, yeah. Okay, we're going to have to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being tugged in every direction. We, we, we must stop it here, which is a very great shame because actually I think this debate needs to go on and on. And congratulations to the Landscape Institute for, for doing it and I propose that we have another one next week and on the week after and, and getting all kinds of different people. And I'm not sure if George will come back, but there you go. But thank you very much indeed for coming and thank you Kerry very much indeed. And, and the final thing, has anybody changed their mind in the last hour? Okay, right, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> a very pointless <laughs> debate. Maybe I'm not allowed to. I'm allowed to, allowed to ask. No, 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 no. Take a wild guess. <laughs> right, okay, thank you very much indeed. Go back to work.